So we've calculated that if you do get a white dwarf to collapse by putting too much mass on it, it'll fuse the uh, carbon oxygen up to something near the iron peak, and the amount of energy we're getting out is vastly more than even these pretty spectacular classical novae we've been talking about. So we need some sort of explosion that's more than a nova. Let's call it a supernova, for example. Is there actually any evidence for explosions even more violent than these classical novae? Well, Paul, there were seen in ancient times some really bright things. Probably the brightest thing was seen in May 1006, actually the 1st of May 1006. The Chinese were very good at keeping records, but this was also recorded across the Middle East and in St. Gallen in Switzerland. And this object was amazingly bright. Uh, it was about a hundred times brighter than Venus, or roughly as bright as the moon when it's half lit, but in a point of light. So that's vastly more than any of the classical nova we've ever yeah, seen. Yeah, so that would be a really bright thing. But, of course, we, don't, we know it's incredibly bright to look at, but, you know, maybe it was just nearby. That's the flux, not the luminosity. Right. You can see the distance. We don't know how luminous it really was. But it wasn't the only one. In, in uh, July of 1054, the Chinese recorded another guest star. And it is thought in Chaco Canyon in the United States that this petroglyph is related to that object, although it's rather difficult to connect that to that, it turns out, as you might imagine. Uh, so there's another one. Uh, and then not much happened until uh, almost 500 years later when uh, Tycho Brahe saw a guest star, or what he wouldn't have called it a guest star, he would have called it a new star in the constellation of Cassiopeia, recorded right here. And, uh, and then just uh, about 30 years later, uh, his uh, friend Kepler recorded another one of these uh, stars. So these things uh, have been there. They seem to, you know, occur in groups. Well, it turns out that's probably just by accident. That's why you've got to be careful of patterns. But they only occur every couple hundred years on average, it would appear. And the most recent one that was seen in antiquity was in 1885, in August, when an astronomer in France was actually showing people uh, the Andromeda Galaxy, or as the nebula as it was known back then, and they saw a new star in it. Uh, but they didn't know what this thing was. And remember, in 1885, we didn't know what a galaxy was. We just knew it was a nebula. So there's a real problem with these things. They were really bright, it would appear, but we didn't know if they were far or nearby. Maybe they were just nearby novae. Mm -hmm. And in 1923, on this plate taken on the 6th of October by Edwin, none other than Edwin Hubble, he found a variable star that he knew how bright they would be in the Milky Way. And this one was many orders of magnitude fainter, indicating these nebulae, or galaxies as we know now, were very, very far away. And so S Andromeda, that object that occurred in 1885, in the Andromeda galaxy must have been very bright indeed. Yeah, they'd be as bright as they appear to be, but in this case, millions of light years away. I mean, that's got to be a phenomenal luminosity. Yeah, about 10 to the 44 watts. So a lot of a lot of 100 watt light bulbs worth. So it's amazingly bright. It's ballpark about what we were calculating for the energy from uh, collapsing a white dwarf. Yeah, funny that, isn't it? Yes. Hmm. So, uh, you know, one of the things you can go through and uh, look at is these guest stars that occurred a long time ago and what, what's there? It's probably a worthwhile forensic exercise. The problem is those records in 1054 weren't really good. This is sort of the area they knew it occurred. They knew it occurred roughly in the area of Taurus. And there's some interesting objects. There's the big uh, giant star Aldebaran, a big yellowish star in the sky. The Pleiades, oh that's an interesting thing, a big grouping of stars. And then there's this thing that Messier found and confused with what he thought might be a comet called M1. Now, if you look at that, M1, we call it the Crab Nebula now, and it's this remarkable ball of gas that's expanding at several thousand kilometers per second. It's out, it sort of looks like an explosion. And if you take its current size and you extrapolate backwards at the speed of expansion, you can presumably estimate when it went off. Yeah, not only do you have the speed of expansion, you actually see this thing getting bigger in real time. If you run it back, it turns out 
it appears to have exploded, whatever created it, at about 1050 AD. So pretty well hmm, lined up okay. to that 1054. So maybe these guest stars and this are related. Indeed, we are almost certain of that now. And they look like explosions and very powerful explosions indeed. So when it was realized with the distance of galaxies that there were these supernovae, uh, none other than Fritz Wicke, shown here, uh, decided to go out and really try to understand these. The problem is they're very rare. If you just wait for the next one to happen, well, I've been waiting my entire life for a supernova to occur in the Milky Way, Fritz Zwicky was a smarter man than that. He said, I'm going to go out and look at a lot of galaxies, but to do that, I need a new type of telescope. I need a Schmidt telescope. Now, this Schmidt telescope isn't named after me or my relatives, but rather a German optician who designed a way to make a telescope that could look at a huge piece of sky at a time and record the image onto a photographic plate. So he built this telescope from parts that he literally hand carried in from Germany and started surveying the sky and finding dozens of these uh, exploding stars we now call supernovae. So presumably because a supernova only happens once every few hundred years per galaxy, you have to look at hundreds or thousands of galaxies at a time to find them routinely. So that's what this telescope allowed him to do. That's right. And he did it over several decades uh, because even with this piece of equipment, he could only probably look at you know, 10, 20, 30 galaxies at a time. But in the end, he had recorded some very interesting characteristics of these guys. They really came into two flavors. He actually found there were a few other ones that have individual uh, representatives. But most of them, he called type 1 supernovae, spectra that show no hydrogen. They seem to have no hydrogen whatsoever. And then type 2 supernovae, spectra dominated by hydrogen, so our two flavors. Now these are the kind of things you'd expect because most of the universe is made of hydrogen. But these ones are very odd. It's very strange to imagine a place where there's no hydrogen. But of course we know just such a place, a white dwarf star where the hydrogen's already been burnt off and all you're left with is the carbon and oxygen. So, working hypothesis, maybe these are the white dwarfs that have got too massive and started to collapse and undergone nuclear fusion. So let's look in some detail at that and see if it can give us what we need.